chocolate. 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 From Dame Cacao, I'm Max Gandy, and this is Chocolate on the Road, the show where we explore hot topics surrounding cacao and chocolate cultures around the world. So let's hit the road. When most people picture a chocolate factory, it looks something like Willy Wonka's. It's huge, with lots of machines and workers and processes which all work together to make a chocolate bar. Or maybe they just imagine Lucy and Ethel trying frantically to pick bonbons off the lineup. Most consumers don't think this far ahead, but at the end of the workday, all of those employees go home. And in a real big chocolate factory... There aren't nearly as many people working there as you'd expect. But a craft chocolate workshop branches away from that model. Small batch chocolate is a human model. Each task performed in homage to the final product, often a chocolate bar. My idea for this story was originally to address the question of why craft chocolate is so much more expensive than that manufactured chocolate. I assumed I'd get a lot of numbers on the cost of materials and labor, but I learned that it's not so much the physical inputs which become costly, it's the intangibles. A craft chocolate business is more than just a company processing high-quality cacao into chocolate. Between late nights, testing new origins, and fixing equipment, craft chocolate is a lifestyle. It's a movement towards better and more equal systems in food production. And it starts where every chocolate bar does, on a cacao farm. My name is Freddy Salazar. I'm from Ecuador, 28 years old. I studied finance and international business away from Ecuador in England. My family uh, started farming project around 10 years ago. When I came back from university, I decided to join. From 2015, uh, I've been thinking, studying, developing, and eventually constructing and managing a project that is called Costa Esmeralda, which is a single-state cacao farm targeted at craft consumers of fermented and dried cacao beans. We saw an opportunity uh, about uh, four years ago and we decided to implement the project three years ago. 2017 was our first year of um, full commercial production with our post-harvest facility fully constructed, and 2018 was the second one. As discussed in the Cacao Brands episode of the show, over the last few years, there have been many more cacao producers entering the market. Freddy's family's brand, Costa Esmeraldas, is one of those. In 2008, the family acquired the land and began planting cacao. The farm is located in northwestern Ecuador and now has thousands of cacao trees and a new fermentation facility. But it wasn't until years later that they invested heavily in revamping the entire farm in pursuit of a very specific goal. Fine flavor and a living wage. A very important part was that there was no good market to sell our beans in. So what we were used to is having anything that was grown on the farm, cacao, uh, was sold to the local middleman. And the middleman would pay us market price, which is the stock market price of cacao, minus uh, 20% at least. If you're selling in the plantation, uh, the price will be less. And if you go to the middleman, the price will also be less. It was a not profitable business with poor technical management and uh, no no market. That's what I found when I came back to Ecuador and started to, to look into what possibilities we had. As a farmer, it's very difficult to, to make a living out of the land that you have, uh, especially if it's not correctly managed and uh, there's, no, if, if there's no appropriate technical expertise that is guiding the everyday activities of the, of the farm. If you were to compare how you had to run a regular plantation, if you were still just selling to the middleman, the trader at that low price versus how you're taking care of the farm now, what are the biggest differences between how you're running the farm? Well, uh, we need to understand that there's two different businesses. 
one uh, when you sell to the middleman you want to have higher yield so you may make decisions to have uh, extreme high yield um, and sell that to the to the middleman when you're selling to specialty you're selling a different product you're selling something that is has been well kept during the entire process so to give you an example if i was selling to the middleman i would first of all have all the trees that i need to have per hectare i would probably put irrigation there to make sure there's no um, problem during dry season and uh, also fertigation so i can fertilize through the irrigation and in that way save also man hours in the plantation the fine flavor cacao market still only accounts for less than one percent of the global cacao market and competition's pretty fierce but the potential payoff for that work is great just this week, Costa Esmeraldas was selected as a finalist in the International Cocoa of Excellence competition. That represents years of labor, effort, and creativity before the cacao even leaves the farm. But it means that they can name their price to chocolate makers, within reason, and earn a decent living off of cacao. And for consumers, this means higher quality at a price. Continuing down the craft chocolate value chain, that cacao needs to be exported and then imported and distributed. Those processes are different for every country, but they're always expensive and heavy on the paperwork. Large chocolate manufacturers buy cacao on commodities exchanges and import it directly, hiring employees specifically for that purpose. But small companies of just one or two people can't afford to do all of that sourcing and paperwork themselves. So they work with a trusted supplier, as Yoon Kim does. What role do you think that Uncommon and Meridian and other distributors have played in you being able to start your business in the first place? Um, they supply small amount of cacao, like the smallest you can buy is one bag. And I think I've also bought like half a bag from them as well when they had it available, um, compared to like some major cacao suppliers were saying that minimum one pallet or container. And how big is one pallet? Uh, one pallet is, oh, it depends. I think it's about eight bags to ten bags, so it's like half a ton. So, yeah. like, 500 kilos of yeah. cacao. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, that is an incredibly yeah. large amount. But it's also because they carry different origins. Instead of getting a, a I want to get a one bag from Peru, one bag from Tanzania, you can just get all from one supplier, which is a lot cheaper for you. Yoon Kim is the Korean-born founder and chocolate maker at Smooth Chocolator, based in Geelong, Australia, just an hour outside of Melbourne. Her chocolate is happily carried by retail shops around the world, and in my opinion, delicious. But Yoon still has a day job, even after four years making craft chocolate. And that probably won't change anytime soon. So do you consider yourself a craft chocolate maker? Uh, yeah, I do. I do. Because it's in a small scale, um, everything's done by hand. Um, it's made with a bit of a intention what I want them to taste like. What are the associations that you have with adding the word craft in front of the title chocolate maker? Are there any other things that you feel like you have to do to live up to the idea of being a craft chocolate maker? Um, well, I think just, just my personal opinion. Um, craft chocolate, I always think something small. Um, you don't make it in a, like a big manufacturing like factories. Mm -hmm. Um, and something that you pay attention to details, such as sourcing cacao and what cacao you want to source. Um, so you're putting uh, flavors or what you want to achieve over the price. Mm -hmm. uh, and also you, um, everything's like a lot of hands work is involved, I feel like it. Um, and just the, something that's a bit more personalized and unique. So, what makes it difficult to be a craft chocolate maker? Um, craft chocolate because um, everything costs a lot of money and especially when you're in a small scale, even if you're buying the same beans, same packaging, 
um, everything just costs a lot more when you're only doing running in the smaller scale. Um, and also a lot of people is not aware of craft chocolate and they don't they can't justify why they have to pay so much money for this small bar of chocolate where you can just go to supermarket and pay two dollars for lint chocolate. <laughs> so if you were to buy a bar of lint chocolate, mm. do you know about I think it's about a hundred grams. So yeah. about how much would it cost? Yeah, I think it's two dollars fifty. Two okay, so yeah, three dollars Australian dollars? Yeah, yeah, yeah they okay. often go in special. <laughs> so I think if you pay full price, it's like three dollars. Uh, when yeah. they're on special, it's like two dollars fifty. But what size are your bars? Uh, sixty grams. And about how much do they go for in Australian dollars? Ah, uh, it's twelve dollars fifty. Okay. So it's it's a big jump. Yeah, for it is a big jump. What is the process like testing and creating oh, and deciding yeah. on um, adding a new bar or a new origin to your craft chocolate lineup? Okay, um, so I sourced the new cacao first to start with. Uh, when I actually received the raw cacao, I smell it first. And if it smells wrong, from my experience, but I don't know about other people's cases, but if it smells wrong, then it usually tastes wrong as well. So it's in that case, um, I usually try a little bit. Uh, like you can just roast it with a um, standard roast that you use for that size of cocoa beans. And you just put it in the um, spice grinder. Sometimes I only have to do the test twice, three times. Sometimes I do five, six, and then you try your best. And if you're still not satisfied with it, then you just not use it. For the single origin. When you're making a chocolate bar, you said it costs uh, 12 and a half Australian dollars, right? Yeah. For 60 grams? Yeah. Okay, so, of that 12 and a half dollars, where does that money go? Buying cacao is the first thing. Um, and also, you need to buy your packaging, you need to buy other ingredients, such as in my case, I'll buy cocoa butter as well uh, and sugar. Uh, but that's only the fraction of the cost. You also have a machine to run, uh, maintenance of the machine, and also wear and tear of the machine, as well as electricity. Electricity is really expensive in Australia, but I don't know about other countries. Um, the water, uh, and if you're hiring the place of the, where your chocolate making, rent, and if you have a staff, um, in my case, I'm the only person who's making it, uh, so it actually doesn't pay for my salary or my labor because I do it for love. Uh, but if you have a, someone who's working for you, you have to pay them salary. Um, and also when you're sending the chocolate, there's a packaging cost as well. Yeah. And also if you, I got a website, so you have to pay for the website maintenance. Um, when you're sending the stuff, also the postage for the boxes and such L bags. In addition to the cost of making chocolate, there's also the cost of storing cacao and chocolate and small business taxes and fees. But some of this can be avoided by using a distributor. It really goes, cacao farmers, usually also middle people are distributors of cacao, chocolate makers, and then there's another part that people don't usually see, and mass-produced chocolate makers have this as well, there are distributors for each area that are in charge of distributing all of the chocolate from one maker or one company like Hershey's in a specific region. So for example, in the US, you distribute and sell chocolate in the US, right? Yeah. But you don't sell it directly yourself. No. So there's someone else who, whom you basically have to pay or to give a cut. But if you didn't have that middle person, would you be able to sell in the U.S.? Um, I still can sell to U.S., uh, but it's, it is a lot of work. Like if you're selling, let's say, 20 different chocolate stores, um, and it's, I think there's a, in U.S.A., I've heard that there's like a lending fee. So if a chocolate store in USA order chocolate and let's say they just order 20 bars of chocolate and they have to pay lending fee of something like 125 US dollars 
plus the shipping, which is air freight. Um, and also, I, I don't know the, uh, the what the custom is like over there. And also, it's uh, more work for me because I work five days a week. <laughs> that sounds like winding, uh, but I have a very little time. And I want to spend my little time in more chocolate making rather than dealing with um, a lot of emails and packing, and, which I do anyway. But like, if you're sending one lot in one place, it's a lot easier than organizing um, different boxes to like 20 different places. And when you uh, send chocolate to USA, you also need to do FDA documents to letting FDA know that there's food landing in America. It doesn't take a lot of time, but <laughs> it's 10 minutes, let's say one place. And then if you have to do 20 places, then 200 minutes. <laughs> so that's a lot, also extra time. After a distributor, chocolate goes to retail shops like the Chocolate Garage. My name is Sunita, and I um, ran the Chocolate Garage for eight years in the heart of Silicon Valley, which was a community gathering space as well as a specialty boutique with craft chocolate starting in 2010, so at the very early beginnings of the craft chocolate movement. Although the Chocolate Garage closed last year, Sunita and her team undoubtedly taught about and sold craft chocolate to thousands of people in the garage's eight-year lifespan. But with craft chocolate, because it's so much more expensive than traditional premium chocolate, there's a lot more work to be done behind the scenes. What is the role of middle people in chocolate? Like, it's not just farmers, chocolate makers, and consumers. Like, it's so much more complicated than that. But that's sort of hidden if you're not thinking about it. Yes, yes. And I think that, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting large question. I'm wondering how to answer it. Because, you know, there's all kinds of middle people, right? The middle people can be interspersed throughout the supply chain. And I think that sometimes it's appropriate um, and helpful to have middle people. Um, and sometimes the middle people's goals should be to put themselves out of business, in my opinion, like, you know, maybe come in and help with development of infrastructure and various um, aspects of of producing high quality cacao, but then remove themselves over time and just let that knowledge and and um, experience sort of stay local and be managed by local people. Um, and then you have middle people like you know bloggers or um, people who are out doing chocolate tastings and then pointing folks to where they can buy the chocolate or brokers. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of different middle people, and so I, I'll speak mostly to my middle personing. Um, I think that, you know, especially at the time in 2010, there was like no mainstream journalism about craft chocolate really at all. If there was an article, it was like once or twice a year and, you know, nobody read it and <laughs> it was probably poorly written. Um, so it was really up to the makers to build their market and to find directly like through direct sales locally or to find the folks throughout the country, the rare stores that were selling that kind of caliber of chocolate. And at the time, you know, six or seven dollars for a for a bar, a craft chocolate bar was a lot. That was a really big stretch. And so as a maker, and I always felt like, especially at the time, like it's sometimes really hard to communicate the value of your own product because we're good at seeing what someone else is adding in terms of value. It's harder for us to really say, well, I'm going to charge $7 for this bar because like I worked so hard to make it and I've studied so hard and practiced so much to get to this place. And so I felt like it was so much easier for me to tell that story, like to listen to the early makers and hear and, and then like find out why a batch wouldn't get sent because it turned out it was, you know, under fermented and super astringent and unworkable cacao. And so there wasn't going to be a bar like to, to know the stories of what was going on for the makers and then transmit that to folks who were coming in to sort of deepen their edu their understanding and their education around, around the bar that they were buying and, and what went into making it. It felt like the educational portion, like sitting there and repeating a million gazillion times at every tasting, you know, what fermentation looked like and how there was first like a, um, a yeast portion of the fermentation that was anaerobic and then the, the bacterial and like just bringing that in in a way where I could like tell my story and be my like geeky scientist around fermentation and how cool it is and stuff like that. Like that I think was so critical for developing a community in this area 
um, mostly locally, I would say in the Bay Area, of folks who were like, oh, I'm going to pay $7 a bar for this chocolate. I'm not sure what that looks like going forward, because right now we're also used to buying everything and having everything just a few clicks and you know, keys away, um, that the, the creation of the experience and people being loyal to stores, um, that obviously if you're putting in that time and that you have educated folks who are there to like share the story behind the bar, that all costs money. And we're not used to things costing money anymore because we want everything cheap and quick and Amazon prime delivered. And so I don't know what that looks like for, for stores in the future, the, the passion and the love runs out at some point when when there isn't enough return. To your point of the role of retailers, I think on the consumer end that people think of establishing brand loyalty as chocolate brands, maybe even cacao brands to some extent, but it's hard for mm-hmm. consumers to feel connected to these retailers who have a, an incredibly important role in introducing people to chocolate. Right, right. Um, I think that's interesting because I think that in some ways, customers can see that there's this high level of integrity, right? And there's this this search for quality and a, a no nonsense kind of attitude. And so there's some brand loyalty in that sense, right? Like, and so if something shows up at Chocolate Maya in Santa Barbara, then it that speaks to you know why it's being carried there because they have this this relationship with Maya and they have a sense of her being very exacting in particular, right? So, so I do think in many ways that there are these larger sort of, there's a branding around the the stores and what, and what people are carrying and their sort of reputation. I mean, it's at a pretty geeky level, right? Like um, it's not sort of mainstream, but I mean, any kind of specialty product you're going to know where is the place that I'm going to go if I want to get like a, I thinking of a customer who used to come to the garage and he had like this beautiful handcrafted Panama hat, you know, and he's like, he knew everything about that hat and like a beautiful leather satchel or whatever, you know, like, I mean, there's people like that who really want to understand products and want to go deep. And then they, they take the time and build the relationship and, and develop trust with someone, you know? And so I think that in many ways, there are places like that, but they tend to be really, really small. And, um, and you know, then come the problems of like how to make that business work and, and have the right kind of model so that you're able to be sustainable and make money. You might not have a good answer, but roughly how much of the final price of a craft chocolate bar goes towards each step in the chain? And again, people tend to think of like, the farmer and then the maker, but there is often also the price of retail and retailing your bar somewhere other than your own shop. Right. Well, so the way I would answer that is it seems that as stuff goes up the supply chain, typically the general rule of thumb is that it doubles each time. Um, it gets complicated because um, when the maker receives the beans and then does all this tremendous value add, you know, like how do you factor in all the things that go into that, right? Like there's, there's a lot of tangibles that even, even the tangibles can be complicated. How do you factor in electricity? How do you factor in, um, you know, the cost of the space you're using, whether it's leased or rented or whatever it is, right? Like those are complicated things. Those are actually tangible, but still complicated to figure out in terms of the overall cost of a bar. And then there's the stuff that's more difficult to quantify, which is 10 years of, you know, experience or understanding cacao and chocolate and food and whatever, right? Like, so um, I think even at the maker level, it gets complicated to figure out like how that all breaks down. For chocolate makers, considering the cost difference between selling to a retailer like Sunita and a customer like myself, it makes sense to sell as much as you can direct to consumers. But running ads and selling online can be risky. 
Well, building a physical shop can be very costly. This was over a decade and a half ago. Yes. How much do you think it cost before you were able to actually make that first chocolate bar? So we had borrowed money from family. We had borrowed money from all sorts of people. So I would say in and around 120000 but we also had to build out a space and build out a tiny little retail store. Allow me to introduce Cynthia Lung. My name is Cynthia. I'm part owner with David Kathleen of Soma Chocolate. And where are you located? We are located in Toronto, and I'm sitting in our half-built factory in Parkdale, which is a little, um, it's a little neighborhood within Toronto. And how did you learn about chocolate and cacao in the first place? So at that time, because it was in 2003, there there were no small chocolate makers. I think the smallest was Scharfenberger at the time and Tamori and Amade in Italy. So there wasn't like a community, a fledging community like there is right now. Um, so it was a lot of trial and error and a lot of reading old manuscripts, old um, technical abstracts. Any book like Marisal's book was out at that time, Marisal Persia. So she had listed story, little bits of um, species and the agricultural part of it all. So it was just all these bits and parts yeah. flying around, talking to technicians from Scharfenberger. Um, and then David took a course in California. It was really geared towards um, bigger, like Hershey's, to make chocolate. It was called Richards, Richardson Research. And that's where it all came from. So he got... Um, sort of like a base level of understanding. And then it was just us going to the hardware store and refitting machines. Now there's a whole industry that services the bean to bar world. But back then we'd have to get old coffee roasters and rejig them and build winnowers out of just vacuum and HVAC parts. So it was really a different landscape back then. How would you say the quality of those first bars compares to the quality you could get using, say, a Premier Wonder Grinder? With every new origin in the beginning, it was just a new experiment. So our first batches were not great. Um, and we even had a lot of batches that we didn't release in the beginning because even as a a newbie, we knew that wasn't good chocolate. So we just let it sit. There's, so there's a lot of money up front, just, um, learning about beans and their characteristics. When people add the word craft or say bean to bar or fine or whatever, artisanal, whatever word you want to put in front of it, what does that mean to you? How do you, Call yourself? Do you call yourself a craft chocolate maker, small batch, micro batch? Well, we used to say micro batch in the very beginning, and we're we're still using that now because we were the only small makers at the time. So we thought, well, we're really tiny. We're not even just small. We're micro <laughs> in the whole landscape of chocolate makers because they were all very big players at the time. Even when we tried to get beans. I mean, now everybody sends us samples of beans. We we almost have too many samples to process because it's very important to give feedback to to the farmers and all these small farms sending it to us. But when we first started, they were just laughing at us. They would say, excuse me, how many bags did you want or how many tons? We said, we don't want tons. We just want two bags. <laughs> and they would just laugh at us you've released dozens of bars over the years so w what is the process like do you have any kind of steps that you always follow when you're releasing a new bar what's what's the timeline like on that 
for a new origin, it, it will take a while because the samples are sent to us and then we we do cut tests and we actually make small batches of chocolate from it and then we all analyze it um, before we even purchase the bean. And I think most chocolate makers will do it. They won't buy beans um, without testing them. So that in itself is is a months in the making before we actually get to a shipment. And that happens mostly with uh, every harvest. We get a new sample if it's a brand new harvest. Um, and then we test again. Some of the farms that we have relationships with, um, we can just buy them just knowing the quality of their post-harvest. And we have conversations all the time. So we know if there was too much rain that season and it's a little bit different, we just, we will trust them on their word because of we've been, we've had this strong relationship for years. Um, and then the actual chocolate making process is, can take a few weeks just to get the bars out. And if it's not good, we're not releasing it. So that's another hidden cost is, when we're trying origins for the first time or we're experimenting with how we're processing it, whether it be we over roasted it or we over crunched it or it just was not good in the first place, the fermentation was done wrong, we just don't release bad chocolate. And we've had a lot of batches of chocolate just go in the garbage. Cynthia and David opened Soma in 2003, but David actually made his first batch of chocolate back in 2001. Here's David, Cynthia's partner, talking about that first experience. I had taken a course in California called Richardson Researches, and this was a course where we made chocolate from, from the bean. Companies like Mars and Hershey's would send their people to this course to learn about chocolate making because I guess they didn't want to teach them themselves. I don't know why. Um, so it was a cool little class. Uh, uh, it was only about a week long, but we roasted beans. We made chocolate, basically. We did all the steps in making chocolate. And also went a bit farther than that, uh, analyzing cocoa butter and the whole day on cocoa butter and cocoa fats and cocoa butter replacers and all this stuff. Cynthia and David have seen the craft chocolate industry really come into being over the last two decades. You know, when we, when I first when we first started trying to purchase beans. Probably Cynthia told you the story, but um, uh, when we called out the bean broker, I forget which one it was, but, um, and I said, you know, we want, we just want to buy one bag or two bags. And they kind of laughed and, uh, and uh, he told me, like he said, no one ever orders two bags of cocoa. Um, he said, there's only, I only have 11 customers. Like there's only 11 companies in all of North America that buy cocoa beans. And that was including Mars, Hershey's, M&M's and all them. Just to give you an idea, like making chocolate was a completely industrial process at that time. And um, Scharfenberger was really groundbreaking and uh, Mott in um, Grenada. The internet was still a bit primitive at the time. And uh, we would Google um, I don't even know if Google is around, but I mean, as you search for um, chocolate makers and what you would get was the Grenada Chocolate Company. So we were looking at their pictures, like they had an old Melanger and a McIntyre. Like that's the inspiration that we got. And we thought if they can do it, we can do it. We've come a long way. Even though like unimaginable amounts of money are spent on those grocery store chocolate bars, the, the ones that are 99 cents or whatever that have pretty minimal amounts of cocoa liquor. Uh, our thing is pretty different. It's, it's doing more interesting stuff. And um, and we can exist like in that space between the industrial guys and, and the bottom and uh, make interesting products and keep going. Hopefully we all keep going at least. Unlike their manufacturing counterparts, they've had to structure their staff and their work environment differently. As they grow, rather than scaling back to increase volume, Cynthia and David have been able to hire more people and buy more cacao from even more origins. There was always a really huge variation in prices because you had the little 20 gram bars and then you had the 
bigger regular size bars, but you would have like poor Solana would be like eighteen dollars. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, how do you determine the prices for those different bars? It really is sometimes uh, the scarcity of a product, like in the Porcelana, um, you know, the the lot and batch that we got, we don't have much of it. So when it's gone, it's going to be gone. Uh, but other than that, the price of the cocoa beans obviously is the biggest thing. Um, and that's the only really big thing that changes, but the shipping too, uh, but sugar kind of, that's always kind of been around same price and the price of beans can vary quite a bit you know it's a pretty simple formula uh, scarcity breeds higher prices <laughs> you know when you buy from let's say uncommon i don't know if you're aware of who you know these cocoa brokers or middle people um uncommon if you buy it from them or from um, meridian they're extremely transparent you can just look on their website see what how much like a bag of cocoa beans is so it's pretty easy to do the math and see where it's all going. There's been times when we've purchased some origins that have been multiple times the market price. And those ones, you know, you you want to do them because uh, nothing makes us happier than making really great chocolate. In the end, you have to charge a little bit more for them. Opening a shop where you sell your chocolates doesn't automatically double your profits or your happiness. Retailing chocolate to customers is a very different skill from the actual chocolate making. There's a good reason you never see Mars or Cadbury shops. For those makers without shops, like Yoon, it's critical to work with distributors and retailers like Sunita. For the most part, they're taking on the responsibility of presenting your chocolate to the world. Do you ever solicit um, ideas of what people think of as like premium or fancy or even using the word craft chocolate? Yeah. So people will say, you know, they'll come in and I mean, this would be at tastings or even when we were open to sell chocolate, people would come in and they would, you know, self-identify as chocolate connoisseurs. And they would, you know, they would either come in and talk about brands that they had. And I would just, you know, smile and be like, okay. And they're like, well, there's six out to taste. Why don't you sit down and taste what we're sampling today? And, you know, and then, then knowing that, you know, they're, they're fancy, like they're, whatever it was, if it was a lint bar or some like Italian bar that they had found at this specialty Italian store, you know, was not even going to begin to compare to, to like this. Right. So like, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't lecture them in any way. I would be like, Oh, that's great. You know, like they sometimes would come in and say things like, you know, I'm really into, it's only dark chocolate that I like to eat. And I like, I only like chocolate between 72 and 75, you know, and I'd be like, okay. So that's great. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to contradict. It's like 72 and 75 doesn't even mean anything because most people who walked in didn't even understand if that was cacao and sugar or with cocoa butter, where the beans were from, you know, were they beautifully, you know, were they beautifully roasted? Are we using vanilla to cover up defects? You know what I mean? Like numbers didn't mean anything. People would come in with their notion of what great chocolate was, whether it be brand or a particular percentage, or it would have to be dark. Most of the time, a lot of people came in with that notion. And, um, and then we would welcome them to taste, you know, cause our model was always that we had like four to six chocolates out for people to taste. And after they would taste, they would understand things differently. When we would do tastings, part of our model was that included in the price of the tasting was that everyone took home their favorite bar. So part of the job that they had, you know, aside from tasting delicious chocolate and having fun was to figure out their favorite and they got to bring it home. And, you know, I didn't necessarily understand all of the possible benefits of that, but I realized that, you know, when they would go home, they could taste that against whatever was in their pantry. You know, they take it out and put it next to a lint 70% excellence bar and be like, Oh God, this is really not very interesting, you know? And so the advantage of keeping that experience going past the actual moment of the tasting, I think was really important for people to, to be able to, to compare it to what their previous understanding of chocolate was. Nowadays, I'm seeing a lot more people who are really focusing on one thing, and it seems like people have sort of niched down. In many ways, it makes sense to try to focus your energy. If you're coming into the chocolate industry and you're thinking about how to participate, it makes sense to do one thing. For example, if someone asks me to do a tasting right now, now that I've closed the chocolate garage, I don't have thousands of bars 
um, in my storeroom ready to go that I could pull. If I'm going to do a 200 person tasting, that's all the bars for tasting actually being broken up and used for tasting plus a bar per person, which is another like bringing a few hundred bars so everyone gets their choice, right? So if someone asks me now to do a chocolate tasting for 100 people, it's very expensive for me to do it. I need to source the chocolate. I need to be really thoughtful. Like there's no wiggle room because I don't want to be stuck with a bunch of bars at the end, right? I've got to be thoughtful about what I order. I got to pull it all together and, you know, like find all the pieces that I bring with me to go to the tasting. So all the gear I use, the tongs, the plates, the the tablecloths, the t- you know, all that stuff, right? Like now it's much more costly for me. So at the time when I had the store that was selling the chocolate, the people coming in every day, it was almost like a wasted opportunity not to do team buildings and lead tastings because I had everything I needed. They all kind of went together and kind of worked together um, to create something that, that, that was pretty robust. Like, you know, closing of the chocolate garage to me, I don't see that as, as a failure. The, the thing that, that if you're going to run your business in an ethical way where you care about labor and labor conditions, if you're going to pay your workers 15 to $20 an hour, which is still ridiculously little money for anyone who wants to live in this area, there's just nowhere else to trim and and reduce costs. My point being, retailers aren't making money either, at least not the ones that I know, like the specialty curated boutiques that are specializing in craft chocolate and, and doing the hard work of like sourcing and explaining and educating and, you know, risking these expensive bars and having to, to, to sell them to customers. Like no one, it's definitely not where people are making a lot of money. Or any money. Working in craft chocolate is incredibly rewarding and exhausting. After many interviews and personal experiences, it's clear to me that as tough as it is to make a living in craft chocolate, the costs do pay off in the end. That is, as long as you remember that at the end of the day, it is a business. But when you're working in an industry you love, work becomes more than a job. It's a way of life. It's easy to get lost in the thrill of chocolate, both at home and on the road. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chocolate on the Road. If you liked it, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts and share it in any way you see fit. Your support really means a lot. And an especially huge thank you to Sunita, Freddie, Yoon, and David and Cynthia. To learn more about our guests, check out the show notes of this episode at the link in the description or on my website at damecacao.com. That's D-A-M-E-C-A-C-A-O dot C-O-M. Have a wonderful day, and I hope you'll join me next time we go on the road. Mm-hmm.